Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Olaf Smedal, and I'm sitting here with Edith Orozco, who has uh, just released her book, Fishers, Monks, and Cadres, Navigating State, Religion, and the South China Sea in Central Vietnam. Now, Edita has her, she's originally Polish. She has her MA from Woods University and her PhD from uh, Max Planck in, at Halle in Germany. She's been teaching in uh, Durham and at the University of Copenhagen. And now she is in Bergen at the CMI Christian Nicholson Institute uh, on a ERC uh, fellowship. Um, this book is the book we're going to discuss is about Vietnam. Uh, I'm not a Vietnamese scholar. Uh, I'm a professor at the, the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Bergen, and I work in Indonesia, in uh, what used to be South Sumatra, uh, in Flores, in the uh, uh, East Sunda Islands, or Nusa Tenggara Timur, and also in Indonesia and Borneo. But I've read this book uh, with great interest, and I'm looking forward to discussing it with, with Edita. It's a book about state, religion and society, and is based on fieldwork in a small, seemingly insignificant, one might say deceptively inconspicuous coastal area in central Vietnam. Approaching it from one angle, one might say it deals with a fishing community, but then as one gets into the book, it deals with so much more. I suspect I'm not alone in opening a new book, leafing through the list of references, not only to look for my own name, but in order to make a quick assessment about what kind of book this is. And in this case, I was intrigued because it was not obvious that it had a specific agenda, especially as I noticed names of anthropologists I had read, and some of them even met, such as Arjun Apadurai, Nils Bubant, Cynthia Chow, Webb Keen, Sherry Ortner, Henrik Wieg, Anna Tsing, and Janet Hoskins. Hi, Janet, if you're watching. Not to mention Oscar Salomon. But this book also draws on work by historians, archaeologists, philosophers, political scientists, sociologists, scholars of various religions, apart from a host of anthropologists, some of them specialists on Vietnam, others on people in neighboring countries, and in her comprehensive take on the current situation in her chosen location, Edita appears convincingly to me to leave no stone unturned. The main subject positions that the book deals with are first of all fishers and farmers, men and women, then local religious leaders and heads of lineages, and finally an assortment of state officials. Plus, I should stress uh, a few ancestors, and we'll get back to them uh, in a minute. As one gets into the various chapters, one gets drawn into Vietnam's history, and not only the recent history. One very interesting aspect of the book, to my mind, is its tracing of the way a once dominant seafaring kingdom in central Vietnam, known as Champa, was vanquished, vanquished by invading Viet armies from the north some 500 years ago. Now, speculations about where the Champa came from abound, but one informed hypothesis is that they originated, it came from Borneo, or Borneo. When they established themselves in what is now known as Vietnam, they were probably mostly Hindu, but large-scale trading with Muslims from India had the effect of converting them to Islam from about the 11th century onwards. They were a maritime superpower, with vast trading networks reaching all across the South China Sea to China itself, especially Hainan, and to Sumatra, Java, Malacca. And it is a matter of historical record that a Champa princess married a prince of the glorious Majapahit Empire in Java the fact that she was a Muslim eventually led to Islamization of that island and most of the rest of Indonesia. I don't know how relevant it is, but it deserves at least a passing comment that the Cham were matrilineal, 
something that the Viet or Kin are definitely not. Anyway, fast forward to the late 20th century, the Muslim charm who, st who still remained in Vietnam in the 1970s were persecuted in communist Vietnam. Many of them ended up as refugees, some in Thailand, some in Cambodia, and many in Malaysia. But that is another story altogether. What's important in the narrative of this book is that the fishing and trading it discusses takes place in the South China Sea, a body of water with several islands, sovereignty over which has become highly contested. It is probably common knowledge that China is positioning itself as a major, soon dominant player on various stages of the world in the South China Sea, perhaps most aggressively. So, all of a sudden, the story of fishing and trade, however competitive, gets mixed up in geopolitics and smuggling and military adventures. Another interesting and extremely relevant twist of fate or of history, really, is the changing valuation of the two major traditional economic activities in Vietnam. For centuries, rice cultivation was the iconic econo economic activity in Vietnam, whereas fishing was always more marginal. But in the 21st century, fish and seafood in general have become increasingly prestigious, and with it, all kinds of maritime activity become increasingly charged. Who is encroaching on whom? Who is exploiting resources they don't have the right to? And so on. And the fishers become more wealthy, changing the balance on land with respect to the relative importance of sacred places and ritual centers, because effort and resources can be allocated to temples and memorial sites, and thus subverting old hierarchies. So the picture that is slowly coming into focus as one reads one chapter after another is of an area situated in what was South Vietnam until the border between North and South ceased to exist in 1975, that presents itself as a very complex multi-layered tapestry consisting of a completely reorganized state apparatus, traditional beliefs, new institutions, rapid economic transformation, changing allegiances, and conflicting interests on a host of social levels, including the changing role of women. And all this is to say, but the long or short of it is that Edita is to be congratulated with the book. It was published jointly by NIAS Press in Copenhagen, Denmark, and the University of Hawaii Press, the hardback is still available, I think, in Oslo it fetches about 100 pounds sterling. But luckily the paperback is just out at a price mere mortals can afford. And it is now available also in the United States. And I wonder if you would open this uh, conversation, editor, with reading a, a, a small passage from the book. Uh, thank you, Olaf, for this beautiful <laughs> introduction to the book. And actually, you very beautifully uh, captured the, how the seafaring um, mobility of fishermen basically capitalize on old historic uh, patterns, uh, which are very often on the Cham uh, capabilities, seafaring capabilities, and the Viet uh, sovereignties. But let me read the, open this with the short um, uh, vignette from the book, which captures this tension uh, uh, in the book between uh, state, religion, and um, the geopolitics of the South China Sea. In February 2007, fishermen from Sahuin pulled a one-meter high wooden statue out of their net while fishing in the South China Sea, or East Sea, Bien Dam, in Vietnamese, in the vicinity of Lison Island, about 30 kilometers off the shore of Quang Ai province in central Vietnam. The wooden carving depicted a Chinese dignitary sitting, seated on a throne with armrests in the shape of a dragon's mouth. The statue had survived quite well, although the places where the paint had came off were covered with shellfish. The fishing crew that made this unexpected discovery placed the statue in the yard of the boat owner's house next to an open air altar dedicated to the earth spirit. A fence was carefully erected around the statue and an umbrella was set up to protect it against rain. 
The officials believed that the statue was an image of a king of the Vietnamese Le dynasty and considered the finding a sign of luck, security, and good health for their families. This narrative was soon enriched with the report of the statue's supernatural power to provide miraculous protection to fishers against various misfortunes. Until very recently, fishers were more fearful of storms, but this fear has been superseded by China's and Vietnam's competing claims to the South China Sea and the associated risk of capture, detention, and confiscation of their vessels by the Chinese Coast Guard. As a consequence, the fishers felt that the statue needed a more appropriate abbot and wanted to build a proper shrine to better protect and honor it. They reported the findings as historical heritage to the People's Committee of Sahuin Commune and asked for permission to erect the shrine. However, the petition was dismissed by the cultural office on the grounds that building a shrine for the statue would constitute superstition. A local policeman drew up a protocol of the occurrence and instructed the fishers not to display the statue publicly. Consequently, the group of fishers kept the statue out of the communal space and held private rituals for themselves. And now very shortly, the summary of that. The sea has always be been synonymous with insecurity for the humble fishers who ventured onto it. The wooden carving that the fishermen pulled out of the South China Sea likely traces its origin to one of the many Martian ships that went down in a storm or in pirate attack while navigating the coast of what today is Vietnam. The wooden statue thus provides a silent testimony to the hazard of seafaring, an activity which is each, if successful, could provide profitable, but which could also fail and cause major losses for the ship owner. As the vignette above suggests, the art of navigation may require not only steering a ship in the most literal sense against winds and currents, but also in a more symbolical sense between the strong hand of state authoritarian power and the geopolitical perils of the South China Sea. Taking our cue from Greek mythology, the fishers had and have to find a way to navigate between the sea monster Scylla, taking the form of a rocky cliff that may stand for Vietnam's authorities, and the Charybdis, a rolling whirlpool that in, the case, in this case can symbolize the South China Sea dispute. In that sense, the fate of the wooden statue is a silent witness of the fishers' effort to call on their religious practices to navigate the various dangers in the seascape of everyday life and global politics. So, this short narrative uh, basically captures the, uh, the whole process, how religion enters the public space and how pro main protagonist fishers in this book, they navigate the authoritative visions of the state and religion, which try to define what religion is and should be. And uh, in Vietnam, as you already um, in the introduction uh, um, signal, uh, religion entered the public space often in the discourse of the secular as a national and cultural uh, heritage. And this, but the book shows that this secular outfit is co-produced not only by the state authorities or even religious modernizers, but also by people who navigated um, uh, the way how they reclaim the public space. And uh, what I did in the book, in a way, compare the way how they navigate the sea. When they navigate the sea and they want to reach the desired destination, they cannot go on a straight course. So they have to take a zigzag course and they have to take into account the submerged rocks uh, or sometimes uh, appearing again. Uh, they could, these rocks could cause the hazard but they could be the landmarks which offered the orientation in the seascape. So this is how they navigated the authoritative visions uh, of, uh, of, of different religious modernizers of state authorities that they have to take them into account. They rework their way around them. Uh, and sometimes they create this kind of alliances, they allied with them so that the poles uh, are come together so they create the relations between the state authorities against the, uh, for example, Buddhist monk who is dismissed their religious practices. And th I think through this book, what I try to show, I build this uh, model of triadic relationship, confrontation between state, religion, and society, uh, which I wanted to sh 
show that it's very unstable in time, that it's change, changing and changeable, that it's not absolute, um, and dissolves this all uh, confrontation which happens, they are dissolved. Um, the other thing which you also, uh, in the introduction, uh, said that the book deals with uh, many <laughs> different topics. And I think this is where the maritime periphery jumps into all pictures. Um, Basically, we cannot understand how religion is enacted by local actors without looking at the political and social context. Uh, so analytically, the book speaks to two big things, the formation of religious, religion as a category and the secular in Vietnam, this division between the politics and religion, and then how religion is politicized in Vietnam. And then the uh, maritimes, the centrality of maritime periphery, which is very important for understanding uh, Vietnamese society, but also a contemporary performance of sovereignty. Quite. Um, um, I think you. I was going to ask you a question uh, uh, that I think you've already answered, and and that question is is uh, is this. Um, since you mentioned the work uh, Hendrik Wieg has done on, on social navigation, how did this notion help you understand behavior and actions by your interlocutors? The word navigating is even in the title, so I think you already answered that one. So, mm -hmm. so, so. But what, what I could add that what Hendrik uh, um, show uh, wonderfully in his own work uh, that um, navigation is it's, uh, always perform perform all, uh, also perform in the uh, time of chronic crisis war. Uh, and I think what I wanted to show is that it could be also performed in the situation of relatively stable. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but 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 still, I mean, as you as you were just mm -hmm. saying, these 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 notion of what is allowed and what is not allowed mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, religious sphere seems to be seems to have changed. I mean, one mm -hmm. thing was pre nineteen seventy five. When South Vietnam was South Vietnam, and some of the area where you worked were actually uh, uh, occupied by American forces, and then of course the situation after 1975, where all of a sudden everything changed. So yes, relatively stable is always relatively stable. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I, I, I would, I would, think. Okay. So, so, so. But my first question actually was, uh, the, the first thing I wanted to ask you, I mean, it's, it's very big and, and, and it's probably best to give it just a very brief answer, is uh, since this is a, is a country uh, run by a communist party, uh, I forget the name of the party, is that the People's Party, the Communist Party, the communist party of Vietnam? Yeah. yeah. Uh, how, how does the fact that the country is a communist country, which is supposedly, I mean, one suspects uh, communist countries to be totally atheistic uh, and so on. How, how does that affect people's everyday religiosity? Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll get more into the specifics uh, later on, but as a blanket statement, how would you, how, how would you answer that? Well, now you open with this question, a big box <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> of Pandora, uh, because it's real, it refers exactly to this process of formation of religion. Right. Uh, and um, well, indeed, if you look at, at the uh, ID of Vietnamese people, uh, so most of them, probably 90% uh, write not, that they have no religion. Uh, and that the open assumption is because Vietnam is communist and because it's atheist country. But actually, what is happening, we have two different ideas about it. That describes the religious experience in terms of a uh, down, which religion, which requires some kind of doctrine, and religion belief, which is a thing wrong, which is much more flexible. So not only communist ideology about what religion is and uh, but also I think the even earlier translation from the colonial time mm -hmm. how the whole term uh, translated are into play so we have this whole mix of right. of different uh, things uh, the other thing is coming you know between different north and south uh, the uh, 
in a way the dismantling of the religious space uh, in um, in Vietnam uh, in northern Vietnam took much earlier um, in the, already in the 50s right, right. and it was much stronger than in uh, southern Vietnam uh, and I think in my book uh, I could show that for example the kind of rituals which were possible which I observed on Lison Island which didn't suffer for example from um, uh, from the war in terms of destruction of the building temples, uh, but also the all anti superstitious campaign was very mild. Uh, so they survive uh, in the form which would be imaginable in the uh, in the north, uh, in the northern Vietnam. Right. Um, just to not to, I mean, would this talk is going to be much about religion anyway, but uh, mm. I was. I also want to talk about a couple of other things. Um, you mentioned that there's been considerable effort from various authorities in order to facilitate purification. Mm. Now, uh, I know in some writings, purification is a, did something bad. Is, is that what you intend? That purification is bad? Because, because is it always the case that people will want to, to, yes. to, 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 to I mean, uh, at times of worship, they would tend to go to a special place. Perhaps the place is, has been sanctified somehow. Maybe it, it could just be a tree. It's a corner in the house. It could, I mean, there's something, there's, there's always, there's very often a, a special place where the outer world is not supposed to, mm. to impinge, to, to, to dominate. I mean, this is a, a place reserved, a purified, a pure space for worship. Isn't that the case? Thank you. Uh, this is interesting question. Uh, the way how I use purification in my uh, book is a bit different. It's not something which I consider negative or positive. It's it's kind of a process which um, goes once again refers me to Webkin uh, work and the and his idea of semiotic ideologies. We can talk later about that, but. Um, what the authoritative visions, whether they are religious or state, what they are doing, they um, uh, basically uh, try to create the boundaries through the work of purification uh, between the world, sometimes between the science, between human, non-humans, between political uh, and religion, religious. So they are where these binaries are coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, what this purification, what I try to show is how these authoritative visions created these boundaries and how actually people carried their own counter purification mm -hmm. when they, through the indiscipline, for example, they blurred this, uh, this, these boundaries this, between different categories, uh, whether they are, um, uh, they could be also spatial categories. Mm -hmm. um, so right. That, so it's rather something which is uh, uh, capturing the political dimension mm -hmm. of, of this of the of the whole process of purity, purification right actually it's 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 actually the 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 it's an effect of the communist party if you like yes <laughs> oh. not really uh well what Kino, so the cadres in the yeah well keen uh, keen Kin said uh, very something interesting that whatever we have whether this is communist uh, party ideology or the religious uh, out, uh, authoritative visions or ideology, they always re respond to the materiality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think what, what, what in my book, I try to show that this response to the materiality might look very different in one location, even within one region, like on the island and then on the mainland, because the materiality it's very different mm -hmm. uh, of yeah. the religious practices of the geographical location. So, um, so the whole process of purification, uh, whether you know it uh, comes from the state, but it responds to this materiality and people uh, uh, and people um, how they deal with that. So, right. And I, I want to move to some more directly political economic issues. Um, you, you were given permit to do field work on an island that had until then been off limits to foreigners. The island is called Lee Song. Yeah. And the strategic position of the island, and especially the fact that its population depended greatly on fishing grounds around the internationally contested atoll islands, the, the Spratly Islands and the Paracels, 
meant that as tensions grew, the fishers were forced to restrict their activities. So perhaps, I mean, I'm, I'm just mm. rattling off a couple of questions now, then you can extemporate. Perhaps you could explain first the circumstances that made it possible for you to, to do research on the island. Secondly, how the political and, and military situation in the East Sea, which is, is known as in, in Vietnam, have affected the inhabitants mm. of Lison, I mean, the military situation. Uh, so, and thirdly, would you say that the inhabitants are better off uh, or worse off today than uh, today than when you first met them? And to add a fourth question to this, has the growing importance and recognition of the island, I mean, the state's attention, the state's attention to the island, has has that affected the average Vietnamese, the average Vietnamese in Vietnam as a whole in any way? So there's a four more or less interrelated questions. The fourth one you can skip if you like. But how did you get to do the research? How does the political military situation affect the inhabitants of Luzon? And would you say that the inhabitants are better off or worse off than when you got there? I'll try to remember. Uh, so let me start uh, how I get there. Uh, well, I started my uh, fieldwork in Sahuin on the mainland. Um, and I knew about Lison Island and I wanted very much to go there, but uh, it took me several months because uh, basically what I had to do, I had to build the relationship and trust with the uh, provincial uh, and uh, uh, provincial and district and then communal uh, uh, authorities. And um, it was very interesting because on the uh, new year, the provincial authorities said, Edita, we want to take you to the Lison Island to show you the New Year celebration oh. in, uh, on Lison Island. And they have their own agenda to that. Probably uh, it helped me that I was from, uh, uh, from Poland. So there was this uh, uh, socialist fraternity between uh, countries. Um, and this is how I first time uh, end up in Vietnam on the scholarship exchange between um, uh, those, uh, the previous communist bloc um, in Vietnam. So that that uh, helped. And then basically I was uh, I had to go to the permission. Sometimes it was very confusing because I was on the uh, waiting for the boat to take me to Lisan and I had all uh, 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 permissions from the province. And then the Coast Guard said, but you don't have the permission from us. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, we will not let you go. And basically, you know, uh, so I have to work on this relationship with Coast Guard too. <laughs> so the 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 the, the permission from yeah. the from the from the province uh, was not enough. So right. everyone wanted to show that has the power and could decide. Yeah, I decide. Yes. Yeah. Uh, whether you can go or uh, not. Uh, and when I was at that time, you know, um, it was very interesting. Lison uh, uh, was not. Really, it's not that it didn't. It always belonged to Vietnam, but it was not really prominently marked on the on the Vietnamese map. You know, like regular maps, which you go just you just find. You know, you couldn't find if you Google uh, in two thousand nine um, uh, on the sun in the internet, you couldn't find any information about the right. island, and that really changed with the South China Sea dispute because what the South China Sea dispute did, it draws marginal places like Lison into the center and basically um, make the mainland uh, external and the margins central. So uh, yes, you have a very interesting map in your book. Yes, which is which Lison become the navel of the nation. Exactly. And that's how it was portrayed. Uh, the Vietnamese, the Lison people were uh, not always happy with that. Uh, they, I think they actually were very much annoyed. Um, because what once they told me, they said real poverty or real problems, they didn't get attention. So uh, there was this case of uh, fishing boats um, disappearing in the sea. And um, and then when the journalists learned that it was just the shortcuts of electricity, not the Chinese who, <laughs> who sank the boat, they lost the interest. So uh, so that's where the annoyance from the from the local people came because they basically, uh, the dispute was so much mediatized, but it also turned the attention from the real problems which mm -hmm. island uh, struggle. So the electricity 
um, only came uh, uh, in 2014, uh, and because of this growing attention to the uh, to the to to Lisson, uh, people. So, so until 2014, there, there was, was no electricity. When all, I have done my research, there was no electricity. There was so, just kerosene or. Uh, so there were a few hours in the evening, but every, uh, if I remember, every second or third day. Not even generators. Uh, no, they didn't have generators. So wow. they, so uh, um, right. So it was it was some kind of distribution. So right. half of the island got uh, electricity this day, for example, and two days later, uh, it was in the other parts of the island. I remember I couldn't use even the fan. It was so hot. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was so hot, so I couldn't. Uh, but. Um, uh, whether they are better off, just coming to this question, uh, what it happens, uh, the tourism, it was a lot of expectation from local people that tourism bring, brings uh, income, that brings new jobs. And what I observe, uh, Vietnamese people from um, northern and southern Vietnam, they were coming to Lison Island because they wanted to identify with the uh, fisherman sacrifice. Uh, um, and they want to experience the mainland from the island. Uh, but they came for one, two days and they never come back. So this tourism was mm. not unsustainable. Uh, so they said there is nothing to really to do there. Uh, so they did, did their patriotic duty, they visited and they just left. Uh, so that was the growing also mm -hmm. um, worries of uh, local people. And then the investment came, which started to build uh, buildings uh, pollute the uh, environment. So I'm not sure whether they're better off. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to be modern, and I absolutely understand that and sympathize with that. Uh, but it has also huge impact on their daily life. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now, um, comp there is... There are complicating things uh, that, that enter your book uh, just about uh, at this point, I think, because um, anything that resembles a, a unified or, or coherent story about Luzon and the Atoll Islands further out in the sea is the issue of, of kinship and, and of ancestors, isn't it? I mean, you have the, you have the national and the local, and then you have the local versus the local um, as regards commemorations. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and you explain how the Vietnamese state is all in favor of ancestor worship, sort of, and, and even positively encourages it, but it reconceptualizes it as the recognition of national, as national heroes who have sacrificed themselves for the nation. Uh, or have achieved some national merit. So how does this reconceptualization, as, do, as it is done by the state, mm. how is that received by the locals? Uh, yeah, exactly. There is this tension which comes uh, what the state wants. They want to commemorate these different heroes which yes. they identify or they want to uh, bring the memory back about them collectively. And that clash with the people's expectation because what the people want, they want that this kin, forgotten kin, become the flesh and, and bone of their own uh, ancestors with the, with the engraved name, mm -hmm. which will be remembered forever. And I think that uh, what I try to show in the book, this tension not only between the national and lineage interest, which um, uh, which clash in a way they come together, but it also creates different expectation what the two sides wanted out mm -hmm. of this particular uh, commemoration, but also between the lineage and individuals, right. uh, because then the the competition or this tension comes even lower in the in the bottom the social on the social ladder uh, stratification. Um, when basically the, the lineages compete with each other. And uh, well, the failure of the one of the female ancestor to get recognition, I think happened precisely because uh, the, the, the village felt that the lineage tried to glorify its own prestige rather than the communal collective. Mm -hmm. Right. 
because all of a sudden there was this contestation between patri lives. Yes, 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 yes. I think we'll get back to some of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to ask you a, a slightly more theoretical question. Mm -hmm. um, um, but let me ease into it by, by invoking mm -hmm. uh, work by Webb Keen. Uh, Mino is one of a number of excellent anthropologists working in eastern Indonesia, uh, and in his case, the island Sumba. Now, you, you have you have already mentioned it, uh, the, the, the key term that that I also want to 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 fix on here: the, the semiotic ideology. Now, can I ask you just before I go on to to, to sort of try to explain to whoever is out there what 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 how, why semiotic ideology, why the concept has been important to you? I think with, uh, what Webb Keen uh, tried to show, what he showed in his own work, which was a great inspiration for me, um, how the Protestant Calvinists uh, interact with uh, local uh, traditions, religious traditions, ancestor worship in, uh, in Indonesia, and how it creates this moral uh, modernity. So semiotic ideology, what he, says it basically captures the relation between the word, science, and uh, agency. And he said that, uh, so Calvi, uh, Protestant Calvinists um, actually represent one kind of semiotic ideology uh, that behind the words, there are always some kind of materiality. And what he also shows that this materiality cannot be in fact disconnected from the social, the social embeddedness. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what I took from, uh, from Webb Keen, um, trying to, uh, to think about how uh, different semiotic ideologies whether the state of religious modernizers, they could be considered as, uh, basically they could be even considered as the same, depending mm -hmm. uh, on the materiality to which they respond. And the way how they respond, it creates endless hybrids on the way. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because that. Okay. So 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 this is exactly where I. Uh, perhaps I, I I don't think I have trouble uh, following you, but I, I just want to mm. be quite clear on this because what I want to ask you if the is if the um, the state semiotic ideology to to concentrate on on not just any semiotic mm -hmm. ideology, but the state semiotic ideology, can it be plural? Because you mentioned ritual revitalization in China, as has been discussed by, by Helen Xiu, uh, Susanne Brandstetter and Ben Hillman. You, you mentioned mm -hmm. them in, in, in this connection as, and now I quote you, a, a recycling of ritual fragments in a rural society rather than a resurgent of, resurgence of traditional practices. So, so, okay, so far so good, I, I, I would say, but can a state, can the state semiotic ideology be similarly recycled uh, or established in fragments? Uh, so, or, or, and how, how can the various state categories make up a state semiotic ideology that make up a state uh, semiotic ideology mean different things to different people. So there are two things here. One, one is the, the fragmentation mm. and the other is the various meanings uh, as they are sort of more or less dispersed in a population, if you like. So mm. how? Mm. This is a very interesting uh, question. I would, I would say first that they are plural. Um, I would say that semiotic ideology in China probably would be a bit different, the communist semiotic ideology from, uh, from Vietnam, because I think where the fragmentation comes. Uh, so even in Vietnam, the socialist ideology draws on colonial experience, mm -hmm. French, uh, on, the, on the interaction with the, uh, with the, with the US during the uh, Second Indochina War, and also on, on China the long engagement uh, with China. So I think we have yes. a different traditions coming uh, to, um, to with creating this uh, state uh, semiotic ideology. Both, for example, in China and uh, in Vietnam, as in, in Poland, they promise a better future paradise on the, on the, on the earth. 
So this is uh, where once again the connection could be traced mm. to the religion semiotic, but they right. then compete about how mm. they imagine this paradise and it, where it should be, uh, when it should be uh, come to become a true. Um, so, and that's very interesting when it comes even to to people how the way how they respond to that and how they recreate and rework. <coughs> uh, that I think that's what I really try to. Uh, show that yes, I would say that maybe I use the singular semiotic ideology, but actually, what you put fingers on something very interesting that, in fact, it's the constant reenactment of the semiotic ideologies in different contexts and with different configurations mm -hmm. as, as they're being perceived by, by locals. Yes, that they're sort of they're, mm -hmm. they're taking notice of it, they have to remember it, and then oh, oh yeah. That's how it should be. If I could, I could like to read yeah, be one. My guest. Uh, write, um, read one uh, passage, which maybe uh, will explain that actually how, uh, because the semiotic ideology sometimes these elements parasite on each other. So there could be that state authorities might use the uh, different vocabulary, even from religious vocabulary like Buddhist and enlightenment, to uh, describe the class conscious. Or the uh, Buddhist monk might use the vocabulary from the anti-superstitious campaign uh, to describe the religious practices. So they constantly circulate not only within the state, um, the state uh, ideology, but also between these different visions mm -hmm. of uh, of religion. Uh, so this is a, the encounter of the uh, state official uh, of cultural officers with the Buddhist monk. In Loy's discussion with the monk, he stressed that he saw no contradiction in claiming to be secular and following ancestor worship, which for him was a beautiful Vietnamese tradition. When Loy asked the monk for his opinion about the beautification on the cliff and whether he identified himself with the people's project, the monk replied curtly that whatever the villagers were doing has nothing to do with him. In this way, the monk draw a clear distinction between the villagers' Tinguong religious beliefs and Buddhist Tonzao religion. Loy decided to delve further into the subject and ask the monk if he would be willing to conduct a ceremony on the cliff, given that people might consider him better qualified to perform rituals. In making this invitation, Loy, who was knowledgeable about local culture, granted a form of authority to the monk who, in his view, understood religious procedures better than the villagers. The monk diplomatically answered that he did not have a clear understanding of the matter, but in the last two years, he had consistently refused to lead village ceremonies for local gods because he found them to be in contradiction to Buddhist teaching, especially as the villagers butchered pigs and prepared elaborate feasts. He then used, he then used pre doimoi rhetoric that associated superstition with the peasant class, thereby distancing himself from the official agenda that prioritize folk religions beliefs as pure and authentic Vietnamese traditions. Playing with the political language of the state semiotic ideology, he called the folk beliefs superstition mm -hmm. and contrary to Buddhist religion. In doing so, he quite directly contradicts Lloyd's visions of a productive cultural merging of folk beliefs and Buddhism. Uh, and they were right. dismissed. Yeah, so well, yeah, beautiful. I mean, that, that made that very clear to me. Thank you. Now, um, one of the, uh, you, you spend you, quite a lot of space uh, in, in one of your chapters um, uh, on one very interesting case concerning ancestry. Uh, and especially how this case of a deceased ancestor who died, uh, I think, precisely 380 years uh, ago today or this year, mm. if I've calculated it correctly. Uh, how she became the center of a hotly contested question, not only of local, but also of national uh, interest. It concerns the farm uh, patrilineage on Lison Island and the death mm. of a 16 year old woman known as Lady Roy. Mm. Uh, your main interlocutor, you call him An, worked hard to get local recognition of the glorious death of, of, of this maiden. And now you explain how the venerated ancestors of one lineage can easily be perceived as a threatening ghost uh, uh, to members of other lineages, especially if the deceased has no children. 
And although it is possible, of course, to ask how a childless young girl can become an ancestor at all, uh, I, I, I won't go into that. Uh, but since the story of Lady Roy evidently plays such a prominent role in the islanders' identification or not with a possible heroic past, I wonder if you could sketch the case, just, just sketch the case, because it is fairly central to I think, your, your overall argument in, 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 in the book, because you also raise the intriguing question if women can serve as icons or, or, or represent, to, to use a more neutral word, a patrilineage in what is effectively a Confucianized uh, social formation. And perhaps we're also back at what we discussed earlier, the fundamental role of a semiotic ideology, namely here again, the state semiotic ideology. I don't really know if that, mm. how that plays into, into it, but perhaps yeah. a few minutes on, 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 the, on the case of Lady Roy and, 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 and why you spend a lot of, of text on it, because it's a very interesting case. Yeah, to cut this little short, uh, basically, uh, one of the uh, uh, decided to include uh, his, fem its female ancestor into the commemoration, state commemor commemoration uh, to Paracels uh, Flotilla, the 17th, 19th century Paracels Flotilla. They already were successful with one of their ancestors, Tamte Unyat. Who's, um, uh, who was the captain of this flotilla uh, in the 19th century, and which one of the islet, islet in the Paracels is named after his name. Right. So, so they have a, so they have a, uh, already, have a claim. Yeah, so they have a claim. And then they wanted to uh, have this, uh, this uh, female uh, also be included. And what they did, it's very interesting because they hired the late uh, historian, Vietnamese historian, Chen Kho Duong, uh, also journalist and um, uh, provincial um, authorities, and tried to rewrite the political biography of Lili, of this, of this goddess. So in, generally in Vietnam, there is uh, some, so when you apply for a position, you have, you have a political biography. But uh, so that was a political biography of this period. Uh, and what they what they claim they claim that she was uh, uh, basically um, trying to uh, warn her father uh, about the approaching uh, Chinese pirates enemy, uh, and uh, she was captured by pirates. And then when threatened with rape, she just throw herself into the sea and uh, died. So in this way, she in a way defended the honor of herself and her family. But the Ayn made something interesting because he also uh, added the contemporary elements of the revolutionary qualities of the woman ah. that uh, her, uh, her uh, for example, her grave uh, was used as a place for the weapons and for the guerrilla. So in this way, he actually showed that even the island actually, actually uh, disconnected with the mainland was actively involved in the, uh, in the resistance fight. And that's what they try to connect this female ancestor also that basically she has some sort of supernatural power and-, and um, Against the Chinese pirates. And the uh, foreign uh, and the foreign enemy during the Vietnam War. All oh, right. The second Indochina. Mm -hmm. So there were all these elements which hybridize and, and come with this, uh, in this uh, political biography. Now the story from the village, which came. Uh, so they said, we never pray in her temple. We never worship her. <clears throat> Our grandfather still remember her because she didn't live like uh, 380 years old. So her death, uh, the lineage claimed that she died in 1645, but they said, no, she died actually 144 years later. <laughs> um, so, and they, um, and she, she just drowned picking seaweed or something. Actually, for 144 years later, they showed that actually the pirates were on the island. So mm -hmm. they, they took me and they showed me their lineage documents. And they saw, listen, the first mention when the pirates came, uh, it's 144 years later than they claimed that she died. Mm -hmm. There was no pirates at that time. Uh, so, they say. Yeah. So that's that was this contestation. And uh, But this is not important whether this the story is true or not. What it shows the how uh, actually 
people creatively used the elements from the semiotic mm -hmm. ideology, so the political biography, mm -hmm. to right. to to somehow to write the the the, <laughs> the socialist story of yeah. the of the of the Goths, right? Uh, and and insert into this uh, geopolitical um, conflict and how actually respond both the state and the people respond to the uh, to the international events mm -hmm. uh, uh, happenings which uh, which are going on uh, and they have a different agenda and different expectation and the result is very different yeah of course yeah thank you uh, very nice um, I, I'm, I'm I'm getting towards the, your your last chapter now um, and you begin it by uh, by recounting an important ritual for a goddess uh, officiated by the leader of the fishing association on the island uh, and, and a few other men and one woman. Uh, there are sacrificial offerings uh, of several kinds, including a boiled chicken. But the chicken turns out to have been sick. Uh, it is spoiled. Uh, unfit for, 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 for consumption. And then you tell us that the chicken was offered by women purposefully. Uh, they are purposefully actually sort of uh, soiling the, uh, the uh, or, uh, or, 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 yeah, polluting the, uh, the, the ceremony that they're, that they're supposed right. to take part in. So, so, so I want you to explain to us what is going on here, because this is where you also switch gear, if you like, and, and offer an analysis of women's role in religious life, in this deeply Confucian and, and patrilineal society. Um, mm. But in order to do so, you shift your gaze now from the island to, 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 the, to, to the fishing village uh, on land, on the shore. And I should perhaps mention that in this analysis, you take inspiration from Anna Tsing's book uh, on, on, on the Diamond Queen in the South Borneo uh, Mountains. And, uh, and, and, and just to suggest uh, how women are sometimes characterized, unmarried women, uh, you write, can be referred to as, uh, and now I'm, excuse my Vietnamese, e chong, meaning difficult, selfish, or even abnormal. So. There are several things going on here. Um, so, what what was going on, uh, basically? Uh, yeah, this is a yeah. It's a, big, it's a yeah. I, it's a I, complex I know story. the question is bigger than it seems. Yes. So probably I will be not able to answer uh, entirely. But uh, what this chicken symbolizes is basically the um, the whole change which took in the cosmological landscape, which which once again is um, was prompted by the changes in the material sphere. Uh, the goddess which, to which the chicken was um, offered was a cruel goddess, Tianyana, which everyone was uh, afraid. The fishermen never even dared to pass the cliff and the temple without bowing uh, their heads. Uh, but with the Second Indochina War, um, when the, the place was passed very often, so the goddess started to lose the power. What women did, they brought another explanation. They said that the goddess just uh, left the temple because she became a bodhisattva. She became, to, uh, uh, she became a nun, so she stopped to eat meat uh, and she became self, self cultivate herself. And that's when the disagreement between men and women came uh, into play because men still wanted to offer the uh, the uh, 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 salty offerings of chicken when basically the goddess become vegetarians right. so the the women they basically the sabotage uh, uh, male uh, ritual and they make sure that the goddess is not uh, exposed to to, um, uh, to 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 break this vegetarian so so is this a clash of the genders then? The, may, the, the men say yeah. that, well, she didn't know she didn't become a vegetarian. Let's go on with the pork and the chicken. And, and the women say, no, 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 she, she, she's, the, she's a bodhisattva. I think there is a, a bit about uh, power, who actually, who, to whom the goddess belongs, because mm -hmm. in the past, it was really the, the goddess of the fishermen. And I think this is the, rec the, the, recla uh, the reclaiming 
women reclaim the, the religious space. They were excluded in the past. They right. couldn't come to these temples. They couldn't worship the goddess. Mm -hmm. So in this new uh, time, uh, they basically, for the first time, they allowed, they could do, they could worship, they could take part mm -hmm. into the ceremony. So I think it's some kind of power uh, going on when they reclaim and they say now, uh, actually that my, our version of religiosity has to be taken into account. Right. Um, you also, you, you go, later you go on to, you go into the, the, the case of a woman you call Sung. Yeah. Um, and, and her position as a healer. Uh, that is a traditionally extremely masculine role that, that she has taken on. Um, now, is her, is her um, ability to do that and, and, to, and to do so with impunity, is, is that, is that I'm, uh, this is a really open question. I mean, do you think this is enhanced by her affiliation to both Buddhism and Kaudai? Definitely, yes. So how does Kaudai help her, do you think, in this? Uh, well, what she's doing, she's claiming basically a higher status with the, another healer who, who basically is possessed by the ghost. So she, she claims that uh, in the hierarchy of spirits, she is possessed by the uh, Buddha mother, and the idea yeah. comes very much from a cow religion. And I'm not specialist on that. Probably Janet Hoskins might help more <laughs> about with, yeah. with that. But uh, that's what what basically is where the where her power mm -hmm. in this whole um, uh, performance. Uh, it comes from the uh, from the Buddhist mother who basically want to help people on the earth and use Zoom as a kind of vessel to do that. And then they are uh, helpers, other deities, which could do more or less, less, uh, 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 less benevolent, less yeah. uh, work, which is maybe the Buddha would not, it herself would not engage. Right, okay. So, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, there's another thing in, 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 uh, in, in that chapter, which is also very interesting, you, you're discussing uh, women who are infertile, and you're discussing women who uh, d uh, do not get married young, and so all of a sudden, when, when they're 29 or something, they're too old to get married anyway, because, because they've, they've lost their charm. Uh, and then you also explain how these unmarriageable women who are ex extremely old, I mean, they're past 30, and they're sort of goners already, then they are allowed to become pregnant and have children. And sort of no one is actually looking very badly at them for that. Now, I want to ask a very simple question. Where do those children belong? Those children, definitely they will belong to women and the woman family. The woman's patronage? Uh, yes. How could that be? Uh, well, that would be, well, that, that's an interesting question, but what I think, why the woman wants the children, maybe that's the first question. It's right. provide them security. Yeah? That's, that's definitely so. So it means that these children, basically, yes, you are right, they will, uh, uh, they will probably worship in the future. Their fatherless children. Their mother. Yeah, uh, but they're fatherless children. Yeah. The, and in a patrilineal society, that means that they're not without a patriline, isn't it? Yeah, but that's it's changing now in Vietnam. So I ah. think there is a new research okay. uh, also by Nguyen Ang, um, uh, Nguyen Tuan Ang, if I remember correctly, who shows that because women getting better economic situation uh, and also the party uh, state uh, through the you know attack on the village uh, uh, basically weakened the kinship, the male kinship. Right. Uh, granting the same um, uh, the same uh, heritage rights to the son and daughters. So it happens now that the women are taking the role, uh, leading role in uh, carrying the ancestor uh, uh, yeah. relationship. Okay, so that is a that is must be yes, a, that's the, that's, that's, a, that's a big development. Yeah, that's uh, the change. Yeah, right, and so also in the fishing change. villages. Um, we are uh, yeah. we have you have a question on on the screen. I think. Yes. Did uh, you recognize, observe any discrepancies between the state's official discourse of religious governance and the local cadre's treatment of religious communities on these islands? 
it, that could you, could you put it back, please? Because it went away a little too quickly. If yes, what motivates this inconsistency? Uh, the state is discussing religious governance and the local cadre treatment of communities of these islands. Uh, probably yes. I can't now think about any example uh, of that, but uh, definitely they were. Uh, I think with the province, uh, 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 the province authorities, um, uh, they they have a very different uh, agenda, but they couldn't just break with the state, uh, uh, the state vision. So they always have to take this into account, but they have their own uh, incentives. And that might once again, not entirely uh, uh, confirm uh, that's what the state uh, wants. Um, I think the, the way how the whole project of commemoration and uh, tourism uh, came out uh, on Mison Island, that shows that two very different visions between mm -hmm. the central government. And maybe. Right, is there another question? My question, did you recognize observers? Oh yeah, that, that, that's the one. Okay, uh, are we running out of time or do we have uh, a couple of minutes? We have a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, I know we've been discussing, I mean, we're not so much, I, I think we've finished discussing your book because it's talking about that for an hour. Uh, I want to get back to where we started, turning a dissertation into a book because, I, I, you know, I mean, this is, this is something that you either do or don't. And, um, and uh, uh, sometimes if one does it very quickly, it can be done quickly. And sometimes if one waits a little bit, uh, then it doesn't take, it doesn't go quickly at all. So in your case- I was the second one. <laughs> you were the second one. So what did you have to do? I mean, how much, how, how much of, the, uh, of the general take in this book have you lifted from your dissertation or, or is it completely different? Uh, so maybe first of all, I very quickly say that dismantling the book, uh, PhD, and um, uh, building again as a book manuscript, I think it's more, more common as it's must in, uh, in the North America to get a tenure. Uh, in the European landscape, the requirements are not unified, so, uh, so that might be very different. Uh, but it's not that different on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, what I did, I did indeed dismantle the whole um, a frame. But you know, uh, recently the historian uh, of Indian Ocean, Edward Elper, said something interesting that the book manuscripts, which are uh, come from the PhD, uh, it's not because people go to the field and cover the gaps, because they teach and they read widely. And I think that's what happened with me. Mm. I taught, uh, so I did teaching and I read widely. and you get more mature, you look at your uh, material uh, with distance. So what I did, I changed my theoretical framework. What I had, I had concept like cosmological landscape and religious landscape. When I try to show this kind of, when the materiality change, you know, whatever happens in the, with the temples that also change how people uh, respond and how they imagine the spirits, that the spirits disappear or leave. But I felt that the political aspects are left uh, around. And so I was looking for the really, uh, for the concept of from the frame, which bring everything, the economy, religion, ritual, and mm. politics uh, together mm. with that. So uh, the ethnographic flesh is absolutely the same. Uh, it got updated after, um, because I make several other trips to, uh, to my location, to my field site, uh, but the whole arrangement and frame, it's indeed required uh, quite a bit of work and uh, rework. And I think the last question that we'll have time for is, uh, you, I mean, now the book is out, uh, you have come to Bergen, uh, mm -hmm. you bring uh, an ERC uh, uh, grant with you from, where you were when you got it in, in Copenhagen. Can you tell us briefly what this new project is about? And as we discussed just before the lights went on here, the situation with the pandemic means that all kinds of, of field research is, is, is put on hold. But 
uh, you know, let's just pretend that the, the virus never, uh, never existed. So what is, what is your new project about? And will, there, and will there be another book, do you think? Yes, so that's what I'm working now. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to do uh, is to show history in motion. Uh, I take the South China Sea as a common space, as a methodological and, um, and analytical unit uh, to basically trace non-linear, fragmentary genealogies, whether they are Viet, Chinese, or Cham, um, and also the shifting ethnicities and occupational identities, whether we deal with pirates, smugglers, poachers, and fishers, um, in both past and present. So that would be book about uh, actually what we could say about the history of the region if we look at uh, island uh, instead of the nation state. Uh, so what kind, of what kind of history it would be? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is actually what I try to show, how the fishers tell the story of the dispersed networks, mm -hmm. connections and exchanges, uh, which are condensed in the nodal points of islands. So it's still very much about uh, dealing with the sea and with the islands, but I think it will be much more historical book, uh, but once again, very much grounded in uh, ethnography. So you're taking this, this area of the South China Sea how and and uh, the Spratlys and the Paracels, and then how how further south the Natuna Islands outside Borneo, further south as well, or probably not to the um, uh, well, Malacca Strait, or or what? I have done research in several uh, in Hainan, in several uh, other Vietnamese uh, islands, and basically how I get to this island because one island leads me to the other. So I'm tracing the connection, like mm. uh, which probably I would. Um, I would never thought about that, mm -hmm. uh, but my new project basically uh, came out, was born because you discovered the, the connections or connections which were, were forgotten with the generation and they, uh, uh, and they come again. Uh, so basically that would be this mapping of this, of this exchanges and, and then show them how they exist in the past and how they constantly actually come into the picture and uh, and uh, are born uh, in the new configurations. That sounds uh, a nice place to stop. Uh, thank you for this conversation. Thank you very much. And uh, just, let's just remember the, uh, the virus. Thank you for this. Thank you very much.